talking about the topic, Pentecostal prosperity and the Baptists, there's one story that comes to my mind. It was in 1988 in the city of Dalwa, Dalwa in the western side of Cote d'Ivoire. I was uh, a student, but to get some money from time to time, I used my photograph going to take pictures. So I went to, to the lycée where the, uh, a group of Christians were having their, their program. It is a group um, of believers from uh, Eglise Evangelique de Réveil, um, a group of uh, believers that left the, uh, the uh, another group of, I mean, another denomination that we call ESO. ESO is a Baptist uh, group from France that was planted in 1925 in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, so typical, like, uh, our own Baptist way of believing and doing things. But uh, uh, the Réveil group left because of the Pentecostal uh, movement that has really penetrated the group. So I went to take picture, was really uh, concerned, interested about taking picture, going and, and get the photograph ready, get my money in my pocket. And uh, a young girl of uh, about 19, 21 years old uh, approached me and she presented the gospel to me. She was very, very uh, persistent. I told her that, no, thank you. I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. She says that she said that you know you will go to hell if you don't accept Christ. She really insisted. I was impressed. I was really, really impressed to see that young girl presenting, insisting, wanting me to accept Christ. But she was so much insisting that I, I even gave my testimony how I became Christian myself. She was still not convinced. She was insisting. Then something came to my mind. And I told her that, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm baptized with the Holy Spirit and I speak in tongues. And then she started smiling. She said, brother, good. <laughs> you know, the joy that I had that this little girl was very courageous. She was trying to, to, to convince me and to accept Christ became, turned out to be sadness. And I'm even sad right now as I'm talking because I should have really turned the situation into a gospel presentation to her right there, but I didn't do it. Pentecostalists. And it is new form that we call neo-Pentecostalism. It's a reality. It is something that is bombarding churches today, especially we Baptists also. It is so serious that we may even be thinking that if we, something is not done, our own personal identity will, will, be, will be affected. Randy Arnett knew that it was serious because of his many years of theological educators here in Africa. And I think he did right to, hunt, to, to, to deal with it. the issue, making it the object of his own research, and a book is presented about it. I want you to know that even in West Africa, we are already aware of it. Because recently in uh, Nigeria, the All African Baptist Fellowship uh, for Western Zone decided to meet in Ibadan, and the topic was uh, uh, Baptist craving for authentic and vibrant Christianity. And the subject somehow was dealt with, trying to find out our own position in this new wave that is going on. How do we keep our own Baptist authenticity? And also, how do we make our faith relevant in this situation? So, I will say that Randy asked so many good questions that 
I want to, us to go through some of them and help to ignite our own thinking, even as we try to think about uh, making a, crew, a committee that we take the tax after on. The first question was, who are these people? Who are they? Who are the Pentecost, the new Pentecostal that we are talking about? And Randy, he did a great job by going deep down to the, to the, to the history of the people. Tracing back the identity of the new Pentecostal, Randy went back to the classical Pentecostalism. You know that uh, right at the beginning of the 20th century, there was this very movement that we call the Azusa Street uh, Revival. And that's where what we talk about Pentecostalism, we start with uh, a movement that is heavily dominated by prayer. The people claim that uh, they have experienced uh, a second blessing after their conversion, namely, they are able to speak in tongue. They call it the spirit baptism. And uh, one aspect that characterized these people was the fact that uh, the manifestation of this spirit baptism, this very experience that they talk about, was to be fully, fully engaged in mission. In fact, in less than 10 years, this group of people have uh, penetrated at least two continents, in Africa and in Europe. And also even going up north uh, to northern part of America in Canada, trying to spread their faith and being a very, very aggressive in sharing the gospel, leading people to Christ. But Randy also did a great job by also digging into the African spirituality uh, that some of uh, the African-initiated churches also could present some of the traces of this very uh, identity. Um, these are people, most of them, that belong to the mainline uh, denomination by then, uh, that have started also to manifest their interest in prayer, in uh, uh, seeking for power, especially from the Holy Spirit, and manifesting uh, some of the uh, gift of healing and things like that. And I will give the example of uh, William Wade Aris in Cote d'Ivoire. Wade Aris is a Grebo from uh, Liberia. He was, I think, spiritually in his background from uh, the Methodist uh, background. And this guy was put into jail during that time. Um, some of the um, uh, African-American who have decided to migrate back to, uh, to, to West Africa, located in this old area, was, were already having this Pentecostal influence that came from William, uh, for, from Simor, uh, for Azusa Street uh, uh, movement. And he, in jail, had an experience that looked like, uh, uh, you know, a, a spirit baptism. And then when he came out from the jail, he became very aggressive, uh, decided to have his own way of uh, sharing the gospel, mainly related uh, on using the strategy of uh, uh, power and wonders, healing people, and uh, uh, run, I mean, running after witchcraft and things like that. He came to Cote d'Ivoire around 1913, had a 12 month, uh, 18 month of ministry. Uh, the report we talk about it in the encyclopedia of, uh, uh, in the dictionary of, uh, of mission, is one of the people that is rep reported about, that he had about uh, 18 months with more than 100,000 people that came to Christ, went to Ghana for six months, had more than 60,000 60, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of people that came to Christ. The nature of his preaching and uh, the result of it is difficult to follow it up, but history has revealed that uh, this type of movement has happened. In fact, it was arrested by the French people because um, 
they felt that it was kind of uh, English people coming to penetrate their own ter territory that, but during that time. And if you follow this history of Christianity in Cote d'Ivoire, you see that uh, William Wade Aris has really, really influenced the life of people because after that, you will see so many uh, shift, uh, schism that happened from, from his own ministry. Many other uh, group of, uh, of uh, traditional African, uh, I mean African initiated ministry and churches that, that were developed out of it. From that point, you will see that uh, Christianity somehow in my own country like Cote d'Ivoire like that has been uh, really influenced by that very, very example. So Randy believed that the Neo-Pentecostal movement that we have here has also, uh, I mean the root can be traced to, to that very movement. You have so many of it in Nigeria, in Ghana, in the central part of Africa, in South Africa. He made a good catalog of it that uh, I would not like to go into right now. And uh, after this time, uh, he observed a kind of slowdown among the uh, Pentecostal movement, but quickly, among the mainline denomination, uh, there was a kind of revival of it that we will call the charismatic movement. And he has identified the charismatic movement very rightly that it is also a Pentecostal tendency and uh, uh, worldview, but these people have decided not to leave their denomination, not to leave their structure the way of their churches are organized. They want to stay within and practice their own Pentecostal uh, um, um, belief. And uh, it has gone across denomination, all mainland denomination. Even the Catholics are having this, uh, this movement among them. We call it uh, Renouveau Charismatic, that is uh, among the Catholic people. In fact, you will see them praying, singing, and doing everything like uh, the Pentecostal people, but they will not leave their churches. They will do it in a, in a building that is not far from the big cat cathedral, and on Sunday, all of them will go to, uh, to, to the church. But they will stay close, and at the end of all their prayer, they will add their own prayer on Mary, uh, on Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, the, the Catholic charismatic movement uh, became so strong and heavy in our own country right now that uh, at a time, I got into trouble with them. Uh, in fact, the church that I was leading was very close to one of their uh, place of prayer. And in fact, we were so much in trouble at the time that on Sunday you will see the crowd of people going to that very group. And there was, it was very, very difficult for us to, to, to face them. In fact, I was even afraid to see some of my church members going there because they will sing like we sing. Uh, they will pray the way we pray. And they will do other stuff like uh, casting out demons, seeing people falling. Uh, we had to pray to ask God to, to give us victory over this. I remember, and I thank God for, for what he has done. One day, the group of these people were outside. I mean, the street was full. People came from all over. They would be doing prophecy, uh, speaking words of uh, revelations. And uh, at the time, one of them started making, I think it was God that did it because it was a real deviation. Started speaking on tongue and saying statements like Frutomugu, Frutomugu, Frutomugu. If you understand Bambara or Jula, you will know what it means, Frutomugu. It means the powder of pepper, you know. And uh, this, this, this people that were falling will, will be shouting and saying that they are feeling some burning sensation. Take them under the shower and the, the, uh, the uh, I mean, the main. Catholic leader stopped that movement and said that they should stop. And I, I, I am very grateful because it has really helped us to, to get out from that 
that trouble back during that time. So the mainline denomination uh, were completely infiltrated by uh, Pentecostal-driven people that uh, did not want to leave their denomination. I believe that we Baptists also went through that time. In our church in Cote d'Ivoire, we became very charismatic at the time. Uh, what we do is that when the missionary is there, we become normal <laughs> Baptists. But when you are not there, then we go into our stuff. You know, <laughs> you know, because you know the missionary, we felt that it will not allow us to, you know, to to let the Holy Spirit move. Uh, so, but after that, in the seventies, there's a new brand that came in, and Randy did right to identify them as the War Fifth Movement. There was also Pentecostal in the way they do things, but there was another dimension into it. That very dimension is that the prosperity aspects came into it. Uh, before, it was about demons, casting out demons, speaking tongues, healing people, but now there's this very dimension that if you are a child of God, you are anointed with the Spirit of God, you should be blessed, you should be wealthy, you should move in what we call a breakthrough and that your situation should change. That was the most dangerous aspect of it. Because in 1985, 90, 1985 to 1990, it becomes difficult. And we Baptists, we started also getting afraid of it. It was the kind of teaching where the person comes, the way he dresses is completely different. It will, it will give the value of his dressing from, from, from top to down, the price of his shoe, and show the, his race watch and, and say that it is, it is a curse to go without financial breakthrough. And you know, if you bring that to Africa, it will, like, it will be like a, I mean a bushfire. Uh, because we are in trouble financially, there's no job, uh, uh, corruption everywhere, and if you say that there's a way by true prayer, all night prayer, that I, I can become very wealthy, then I will vote for it. So, it is within that very context that the Neo Pentecostal movement will find its, its uh, I mean, its, 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 its ground. And a new Pentecostal movement, it is this very, I mean, I will say that it is an assemble of all these aspects, putting more emphasis on the, on the person of the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, namely, giving him power to be able to live the Christian life, but even more so, to have impact and to dominate, about, uh, to have victory over all his own daily and reality concern. So, it has been penetrating all denomination and Baptists, Baptists that as we are here today, and uh, in fact, we, Randy Annett also added two other points that has really, uh, I found it very interesting. I've not seen in any other document that, uh, that people uh, that have concern about it. He, he, he spoke about the Le, Le Ministère. When he said about Le Ministère, it's a French, French-speaking word. And it is a, another deviation of what we can talk about Neo-Pentecostal movement. Neo, these groups are groups that will leave the church and start their own small prayer ministry. In fact, they are not recognized about a part, I mean, they are not attached to any denomination. And in, in Cote d'Ivoire, in 1990, it became a big issue. 
before the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the period of the 90s in Cote d'Ivoire, we, we, we were under one political uh, uh, authority. There was no multipartism. But when this one movement came, uh, it affected the churches at the same time. Uh, it was time now for everyone to, to, to have his own group and to be his own leader. Le ministère uh, became also a big challenging issue because they were able to organize themselves. There was no particular denomination that they were attached themselves to, and they decided to, con I mean, to go against the mainline denominating churches that were existing, about, let's say, seven churches by then. Uh, and uh, everybody was also looking for the favor of the government, of the authority, because the new governments, the new parties, were also looking for power, I mean, be able to, to, to win more people in their own group. So, they became well-recognized people. Uh, you cannot do without taking them into account in the political ground. And they started multiplying, you know, in a great number. And because of the, I would say, the average prosperity that, that they were undergoing, they became a very great source of temptation uh, for mainline churches like ours. In fact, you will see them growing, you will see them driving good cars, penetrating the, the presidential powers, the president dealing, relating with them. So it, they became very, very influential, and, uh, and, and Baptists started copying them. Uh, the seven points that uh, I've seen, the seven elements of a Neo Pentecostal movement that I've also observed. I've not seen Randy speaking about that, but that's my own personal observation in what we call the candy prayer. The candy prayer, these are prayer, prayer camps. You can see them right there somewhere in the nature, uh, in the, in the, I mean, far away from the village, from, from the main city. They don't have normal building that we have. Uh, they can use any uh, traditional way of building their own place. And... You see people coming to seek for healing, deliverance, prosperity, children, among these people. I visited two of them about uh, a month ago, went, sat down there, uh, did some interview, and their main belief is that pastors are corrupt and that they don't have the anointing and the power of the Spirit of God. They are just there to embezzle churches, take money from uh, believers, and they are not ready. They don't ha even have power in the anointing of God to, to heal people. And you will see your church members taking their sick people and going to this prayer camp for healing for deliverance. And when they do that, that's where their tithe and offering are going. In fact, I've seen... Uh, one of the person, one of the uh, prayer camp that I visited, I've seen people bringing their <laughs> sick one from Abidjan to come and attend to them for healing. So, and you see, church members are really attracted to that because uh, they they see that their solution is being solved and that uh, their people are healed. And when you are facing this type of testimonies. Evidential, uh, I, I mean, proof that people give, it becomes very challenging. Somehow, you as a, 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 a pastor from a mainland denomination, what are their characteristics? How do you recognize them? You know, Randy did a great job. He said that to recognize them, you should be watching out to the following element. First, these are people that are very, very driven to manifestation of the gift that as the Bible speak about it. They want to see the signs. They want to see miracle. Any worshiping service should be a celebration of miracles of deliverance. In fact, these are a group of people that uh, believe that God has given power to his own people, power over evil. People will take them quite, quite often like uh, 
uh, dualistic people, but I, I don't believe that. I don't think that they are very dualistic. Even though they oppose God to the devil, but God is above it. So there is no equal forces manifesting itself here. They believe that evil is in the world, but there is a solution to it, and there's, the solutions are very tangible. And the people every day are looking for experiences, a breakthrough to their problem. You know, they, they will listen to your teaching, but they will tell you that the kingdom of God is made of what? Power. That mainline churches will be talking, they will be speaking, theorizing, giving big words, but when it comes to manifestation, you cannot see them. So, uh, and because African people like seeing what you talk about being manifested, so they are really, really making impact. So, the people, it, to recognize them, Randy said, you have to watch out up to, to, to their soteriology. I mean, their doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation is comprehensive as we talk about, but the flaw of it is that it is limited to the well-being of the person. Uh, very recently in Baptist churches, when uh, you go to, you want to baptize people, and you ask them uh, to tell you about his salvation experience, he will tell you that uh, in my family, uh, when we go to school, there is no success. Nobody can go through his, uh, his exams. But uh, there was a day a pastor prayed for me, and I got succeeded in my exam. So I'm a Christian. <laughs> you hear people saying that I was sick, I was really sick, and they took me to the prayer camp, prayed for me, and God healed me. So I'm a Christian. So that is a summary of many of them. I would say major, a majority of adherent, people following. That's how they will explain their salvation experience. There is no encounter with the reality of sin and the fact that you are being convinced of your sinfulness and that you are being challenged to repent from your sin and that the Spirit of God has really given you a new life regeneration. That clear understanding of salvation is not there. And the people see themselves as special people, Randy will say. To be a special people is like, like a new set of believers, completely different from others. People that uh, are immune to some of the reality that you can go through as sinners or even as sick people. They believe that they are a new group of people or believers. And that's very dangerous, quite dangerous. So he gave that list of uh, uh, signs that can help us recognize them. He went even to the point of the way they worship. They worship, very vibrant, dancing, adoration, testimony, very short time of preaching and a long time of ministration. When they talk about ministration, you finish preaching and then the, uh, the man of God will come and take all this time, uh, you know, ministering to people, healing and calling for God's favor upon the life of people. So, during the, the, the worship service, the worship service is blessed when there's good testimony about God's healing, breakthrough in the life of people, and if people see uh, manifestation and people being delivered from the, uh, the, the uh, from evil one. The organization, Randy will say, is, uh, is, is based on those five uh, different uh, gifts, personal gifts that God gave in Ephesians chapter 4. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teachers. And the order is completely what it is among them. That is, the bishop is the big man, is the higher level, and uh, the prophet will come close to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the apostle. After that, you have the evangelist, who is also powerful, somebody that God uses to heal people, deliver. It's not just about winning souls, 
but also being able to, 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 uh, uh, to, to manifest the gift of healing and things like that. And then the pastor uh, coming down to the letter and finally, you see, the teacher. So what we are doing here will not interest them because that's the lowest level. You know, you know, you know a teacher is a, somebody who talks a lot and brings books. He cannot have any impact. See, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, starting from verse 11, that order is what their mindset, the worldview will see as how the church should be. I remember when I came back from the state, I went to the hospital, uh, and uh, that's, the, uh, I mean, to the clinic. My wife was working in that uh, clinic before we went, and, uh, and, and the lady, you know, she wanted to write my name down. I gave my name. She said, what title now? I said, Pastor. I said, no. You know, I thought you became now, you know, you went up <laughs> in, the, in the land. So they are very, they follow the hierarchy in the way they organize things. And uh, Randy was very objective to say that it's not just the authoritarian people, but people that are very gifted in business and also even in delegation. I think that was okay. The, another thing that, is, you can, that can help you recognize them is they are very media friendly. A typical Baptist, we say, does not want to be on the camera. If you look for our churches in, 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 in Francophone country or even in West Africa, you will see that our own churches will be the one that is very difficult to find. You know, whereas their own church will be on the big streets, you know, the main junction, you know, where everybody will pass. And they are always on the television. I mean, they are very good when it comes to media and communication. Question. Andy will ask, why are they making it? Why were these people really making it? And he gave some element that I want to share with us. I know our time is going. So first is the worldview. The worldview is a set of prepositions and assumptions held consistently, or uh, consciously or unconsciously, but very consistently about the basic understanding of the reality. And it is by which people do everything they do. They think, they dress, they eat, they live according to their worldview. So Pentecostal are really making it because they come down to the level of the worldview of the people. In fact, they study what you have and they give you what you want. That's what uh, it is very, very common to them. They believe that all problems have a spiritual root, you know, in fact, uh, to follow the, 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 the point of uh, S.L. Grave, they don't believe that, you know, spirituality, the metaphysical and the physical is divided. They see that there's a direct connection. And I think as Baptists, we should pause and think a little bit about it. You know, that life, you know, th these people think that there's always a spiritual root to what is going on. And that is what they want to find out and give a solution. They look for growth, numerical growth. You know, about numbers, they want big numbers of believers, attract number of people, and they want also material growth, prosperity growth. They want people to have a breakthrough in their life. So because of that, naturally, people want to go to, to them. And now, uh, Randy asked another question. I, I, I added maybe another, uh, another point to it that the reason why these people are making it is that, especially in Africa, is that they know that Africa is a group of people that are either dominated by fear or by power. We call it fear and power, you know, worldview. And you will see it in everything we do. In, in everything we do and the way we understand spiritual, spiritual life. We believe that life is controlled by powers. And you have to struggle and find your way through it. If not, you are completely at the mercy of what is going on. So these people came and presented 
a Jesus that is very powerful. That's it. A Christology that is very powerful. And a Holy Spirit that is ready to help you. You know, that is the reason why they are making it. Most mainline Christians, if you ask them, they want to tell you the truth. They can live their faith in Abidjan, in Boake, but very few of them will accept to go to the village. Because you know that when you are going to village, you are going to be in trouble. And you are a Baptist, you know. And you, 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 know that you, 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 you know that you are born again, but at the same time, somewhere in your heart, you are afraid to go to the village, you know, to attend to this normal village. And that's where, in fact, you're supposed to go and, and, and fellowship with the people. You are afraid that somebody over there wants to kill you. And the people who want to kill you are those that are very close to you, okay? The Yoruba people will say that uh, if the death that is in your house cannot kill you, that one behind the window will not be able to kill you. So we are always afraid. Deep down somewhere, fear. Even our president is afraid, you know? The army general is afraid. There's that very fear. And here, all Africans here, they're afraid. That is true. You know, now, these people come and say that when you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives you power, and you cannot be afraid of anything, anything because it will give you victory over that. So people are attracted because of this worst fear battle that uh, the Spirit of, of God can help you uh, 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 have victory over. So, now, how do you ask the next question? How are people responding to it, special Baptists? How are they re responding to this very movement? It gave about five, if I'm not mistaken, five responses. The first one is that rejection. I mean, and that's most people that are very conservative, want to be, to be faithful to, other, to their, main, their mainland belief. He called them traditional uh, attitude, rejection. I think that was the first the first reaction when this movement started coming into our churches. I remember one for a missionary slapped one young boy in, uh, in Ganywa, you know, because this young boy was doing this kind of uh, speaking tongue and things. And I slapped him <laughs> <laughs> and told him, get out from there, you are possessed. Or you are, you are, you are, no, you are out of your mind. That's what he said. He said that you are telling the very fool and shook him like that, slapped him. But that didn't help, you know. <laughs> so another reaction is that of uh, restriction. And Randy did exactly. I saw. I saw that man. He said, maybe he's a detective, because because it is right, you know. The restricted reaction is people that open the window for the Pentecostal to come in, but they are controlling them. They restrict their own emotion, their own engagement to it. They do it secretly when the missionary is not there. You know, we know that you will not come to deny vigil. Okay, that you will not come. So there, we, the people will go and blow and let the thing happen. So that's the restriction. And during the worship service, they will not want somebody to speak in tongue to disrupt people. Maybe they will allow you to come and speak to the leader, to the deacon. This is what I saw. You know, that kind of way of, uh, of trying to control it. And then the third movement, it will, the third response is those who are really, really engaged. They are completely open. But they are still within their Baptist uh, 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 denomination. But you can see now that in the way they do things, they are completely Pentecostal. You know, the worship is very Pentecostal. Uh, and then there's the fourth level that it will call the world faith completely uh, engagement. These people will uh, include prosperity uh, mindset into it. They start dressing the way the people dress, organizing the church the way it is organized. They may even change the name. Say that they are no longer Baptists. Now, do you know, we have Pentecostal Baptist churches, you know, that, that exist. 
And finally, there are some people that are completely fake. Imitation, I will say that is the extreme of it. Uh, they can go and find power from en- every, anywhere in order to manifest power and drive people towards them. So those five uh, reactions exist. And I will say that when it comes to Baptists, you will see more of a restricted group and some open, openly engaged at this level, especially when the, the convention, when the Southern but the IMB has decided to, uh, uh, to go for the unrich people group, and then you are no longer among us, we are free. So uh, we become more free to do. Uh, the, but you will see that they are, some are very conscious of their Baptist heritage. Uh, it's not that they are, they are ready to lose their Baptist way of doing things, but now uh, the restricted mindset is there and more people are engaged towards Pentecostal uh, uh, way of doing things. Now, uh, if you have to identify them and, rec- uh, and classify them, uh, uh, I remember Dr. Yusuf Obaje. He wrote about, uh, he wrote a book on Pentecost, uh, Pentecostalism, and he gave two groups. He said, to him, he sees two groups, those that he called old goggles. Uh, these are the traditional people that completely oppose, and those that we call raw materials. The raw materials were students in the university, uh, and at the time they were calling them scripture union, and they were completely open to this movement, ready to go with them. They would draw out the, f- the former jacket of their forefathers, uh, thinking that Baptist is something that keeps you uh, slow, does not help you. Uh, so the Baptists themselves, why are we attracted to it? Why? Randy gives the response. He said, first, there's the problem with our own policy, uh, the, the church policy, uh, talking about congregationalism and democracy. Uh, up to now, Baptist will say in uh, all our meetings that we have problem with, uh, with uh, autonomy of the local church. Uh, and the reason is that many people could not understand what is the autonomy of the local church, how does it relate to the convention, and what is the authority, and, and when we talk about uh, the decision being made by the group of believers, not the pastor, what does it mean, what's the authority of the pastor? So that is a confusion that Randy believes that has to find a solution if we want to solve this very significant issue. Because when you look at the Pentecostal guy, when he's doing things, people are following him, they're listening to him, he's the one who makes decisions, he has all this power, this all authority, and people follow him. So even pastors or Baptists can be tempted by, because of that. So a solution should be, should, be fa- should be found when it comes to our, uh, 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 the way we understand our church. Uh, also, Randy said, Baptists are really attracted to it because the movement has a very contextualized way of presenting the gospel and ministering to people. We've spoken about it yesterday, talking about the biblical hermeneutics of the people. And I, I, I said it's true that uh, the people are very shallow, not deep, when it comes to their biblical understanding of it. But there's one thing that attracts, is the way they communicate, they talk. You know, it is not enough to have this stuff, the best way of doing things. You should know how to communicate it. You know, when you come to the pulpit and you say that Carl Bart says so, 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 and then you start giving the critical analysis, grammatical, syntactical, you know, background of the thing, the man on the chair, on the pew, when it comes to Baptist, is not interested. He starts sleeping the way you sleep right now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he is not interested, you know. You know, if you did your 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 exegetical work in the room, 
You leave it there and then give the stuff. Let us find the fruit of your exegetical work. Don't expose it here. You know, it impresses people, but it does not, conf- I mean, it does not convince them at all. You know, so, but these people will speak in the way that goes to the heart, touch the people, and people are moved. And the Baptists are attracted to that. I will also say that one of the things that I told them, Randy even said, is the nature of the gospel. The gospel that they present is the powerful gospel. You know, um, you know, the, if we present the gospel from a more, um, what I we call, from uh, the way Paul presented the gospel throughout the book of Romans, from the background of, of justice, of justification, it is true, it's biblical. But these people want a dynamic gospel. They want the gospel that's, that, that where the power is being manifested to break whatever may be uh, the, 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 the obstacle between humanity and God himself. And that's very attractive in African context. We have to find out what to do about it. So, also, it said that the people are attracted to it. They are attracted to it because of the fact that uh, they set a very high expectation. That's what Randy said. You know, they want, they, they require a lot from their people. And people are attracted to that. So, in their behavior, they make people dream of the best. And people want to dream. They really want to. But it took time to talk about their weakness, though, their weaknesses, though. Uh, these people, in the way they present the message, is more centered on human being, anthropocentric orientation. That is, the gospel, the message, everything centered around man, his need, his weaknesses, and things like that. And he feels that that is very dangerous. I agree with him on that. Also said that uh, the salvation... Uh, uh, is, is, is more related to the well-being of the people. That is true. And I agree with him on that. You will see it in the nature of the profession of faith of people today. They will talk, as I said earlier on, they will talk about the one good thing that God has done to them in, 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 in their life. That is the reason for their salvation. Uh, also, Randy said that one of their weakness is the fact that uh, uh, the authority of the word of God is completely undermined and is done in a subtle way, in a subtle way. They will quote the Bible, they will quote Bible verses, they will read Bible texts before doing everything, but if you listen very carefully, there's something added to it, namely their personal experience that come to validate even what the scripture says. Whereas it is the other way around. It is, should be the scripture that validates the experience. But here, that we validate the experience, with the, the scripture with the experience. You will see them preaching and talk about uh, God is powerful. This is what the test said. And then they will say that there was a time I dreamt and during that dream, so, 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 and that will be very, very motivating, very moving. And if you see in a very subtle way, that is where the strength of the argument is. So, that very subtle, you know, uh, uh, way of undermining the authority of the scripture is something that should be watched, uh, that, that, that we have to watch out because at the end of it, what will happen is that uh, that very personal experience will take over. And that is what the people that are listening will, will follow. Now, uh, the, uh, the biblical hermeneutics aspect of it, you know, yesterday you spoke about it. I, I don't want to go uh, on it because my time is completely gone, done. How do we handle them? How do we face them? Randy gave some suggestions. He said first, we should insist on five things. I added one. 
said we should insist on five values. First, the authority, you know, the source of authority, namely is the scripture, and we said it. Second, the way we dig into the scripture and we expose it, namely the rule, our, our rule of, of, of interpretation, biblical hermeneutics. And also, he spoke about orientation, which I think is talking about discipleship, you know, helping the people to grow. And when it comes to discipleship, I want to fault a little bit the way we do this discipleship here. Our way of discipleship is more like, uh, uh, I would say, it's like, you know, coming to class and doing a lecture. You know, if our discipleship does not go beyond that, the results will not be something, you know, to, to, to impress the, the Pentecostal. You cannot know somebody until you start rubbing with him. You know, uh, uh, Reverend, uh, one of my mentors that I love very much uh, said the key word is tribo, which means, you know, you have to rub with each other, okay? So when you are with people, you will know them very well. You know, uh, it is not just about uh, uh, the follow the master. You can do follow the master, but if you are not with the people, you cannot impress them. When the first disciple came to Jesus, they told him, where do you live? It is not, where is your classroom? Okay. He was moving around with them. I think we should think about that. Even our theological school. I, I, I hate, I don't like the mindset that we have in our seminaries. I don't know. This kind of distance that exists between teachers and students, please, it has to go. Because there was not that such distance between Jesus and his own people. Why can you not come down to the level of these people? The best place of doing discipleship, me in my life, is in my car. When you are right there sitting down by myself, I impact your life. When you are going about your daily things. In fact, if you read, you read, you do the exegetical aspect of Matthew chapter 20, 20, 28, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28 from verse 18 to the end, all the verbs that are there, beside the fact of making disciples, all are participle. That is, as you go, as you live together, as you move all around, impact the life of people. The fact of categorizing life, systematizing, separating aspects, so the fact that Sunday is different from Monday is the root of our, of our trouble. We have to be moving with people, living with them, and then impact them. People are changed as you live with them, not just coming and uh, inculcating things you know, giving a set of things to impress them. They want, you may impress the head, not the heart. And the Pentecostal, they know how to do that, moving with people. So, the reality of sin. In most African theology, in the African traditional religion, we see that sin, there's something, there's a flaw in our understanding of sin. There's something that is in un a biblical understanding of sin that we need the people to understand very well. Sin is not just morality. It is constitutional. It is something that is related to your, I mean, your own being. And it takes God himself to change it. If sin is like being dirty, you just have to clean it. But if sin is about your nature, it is regeneration, it is transformation that is needed. Salvation, Randy said, is a key issue. We have to come down to sit down with the people and make sure that our members are really saved, that they know Christ, and they have been regenerated. Our churches are full with so many Nicodemus today that are not transformed really. They have not experienced the power of the real regeneration. It takes that. And I added one point. I said we should give a good response to the African theodicy. Evil is a reality. You cannot, you cannot just pass by. If we don't have a theology that speaks to what Africans are going as challenge every day, if we don't have a solution to it, 
we are just wasting our time. So, uh, Randy did an excellent job. I know the time is completely gone. He, he gave some practical example, like we should have a way to monitor neo-Pentecostalism. He gave three. He said there are some entry doors. Watch out for the prayer groups. That is the entry door. Watch out for the worship leaders. These are the prayer, that's, these are the entry door. And now watch out for key spiritual leaders like pastors and things like that. And when it comes to pastor, then come the responsibility of the seminary, as we are talking about. You know, for us in Francophone speaking country, we are in trouble. Because when you go to Nigeria, Ghana, and many other countries, they are very responsible. If they take a decision, it's after some think time of thinking. We need good training. We need real, real good training in our basic Baptist way of doing things. We need a place where we can criticize ourselves, think about the way we do things, and then think on our own from the biblical point of view and find solution to our people. And I think that the seminary is the right place to do it. That's why we feel that we should come back together and start working the way we have been doing before. He said we should build a Baptist DNA. I call it indoctrination. I'm not afraid of the word. <laughs> yeah, I'm not afraid of the word. I think we should indoctrinate our people. Dogmatic theology is part of theology. If you are not proud of, your, of who you are, and you cannot tell your child who you are, I'm, af I'm very happy when my child is called Adioye because it is me. And I think I have no apology to offer to anybody to be who I am. You know, I, I, we are very conscious before we became a believer, a Christian, that's first. And secondly, we decide to be a Baptist. And it's a responsibility, not only to be what we are, but to contaminate people of who we are. Okay, so to me, it's right to inculcate and build a Baptist DNA, develop balanced leader, and the word is well qualified, balanced leader. I mean, leaders that know who they are, they know their limitation, their weaknesses, ready to prove on it, but they are not ready to lose who they are. I think that's possible. It is possible to be who we are and improve on what and who we are without changing completely. And he said that we need to build and create an Africanized church policy. I'll be happy to see that committee and to function in that context. An Africanized church policy. We really need to do that. He said we should find a way to counteract the new Pentecostal vulnerability. That is not to destroy, not to slap people, but we need to do work to identify their weaknesses and build on it. That's how we should do. And then to know how to appropriate what constitutes the strength of the, the neo-Pentecostal people. So uh, in uh, Ibadan, last, uh, uh, some times ago during this meeting, I think we, we, we saw some of our leaders started work, starting working on it. I appreciated the work of Dr. Uh, Professor Niola. He did an excellent job. Why? Because it was biblical. He gave this, the, the, the background of Pentecostalism, of, of Pente Pentecost from the Old Testament. And he really did a good exegesis on Acts chapter 2, because that's where the problem comes from. He said the problem is language. What it's all about is the Holy Spirit. And you know when the Holy Spirit is working, it can go beyond your way, your ability to express it. And it made us understand that the language in there can be confusing. When he said that it is like a wind, it is not a wind, it's just a comparison. You know, when he said it's like, a, it, like fire, it, there was no fire there. You know, but do you take time to read and to listen to the text? Okay, but he opened up to say that, 
Pentecostalism is a blessing from God. Blessing for all believers in Christ. In fact, it takes the Pentecost for you to be a child of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot be the child of God. We need that power that Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is talking about. Not only to, uh, 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 to live the Christian life, but even to be able to be a good witness, as Christ is talking about. Br uh, Dr. Kevin said, Ebele, how do you deal with it in your own church? You know, time is gone. Uh, <laughs> I would have shared it. Randy is going to be with the Lord. We are here. Pray that the Lord will help us to be faithful, even on, to, to the glory of God himself. It's been an honor. I, he would have done better. No, but <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.